I planned on delivering a Bible study tonight entitled A Theology of Reconstruction, but given all that has taken place this day, I felt it necessary to let God speak to our current crisis. And so, around three o'clock today, God really told me what I was planning on doing I would not do. And so this has been a hurried word that I have sought to receive from our great God. I want to call your attention now to a passage of Scripture found in the book of Acts. And there in the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning at the 23rd verse, we find the words of our text for this message. Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 23, from the New Living Translation of the Greek New Testament, the word reads, about that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. That's what the early Christian movement was referred to as, the way. After all, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith, who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together, along with others, employed in similar trades, and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, but as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this, not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshiped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. At this, their anger boiled. They began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and, Arist and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting one thing, some one thing, and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for about two hours Great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session, and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government, since there is no cause for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and they dispersed. In these few moments, I'd like to use as a subject from which to share chaos in the city. Chaos in the city. All hell broke loose. Crazy. Insanity. 
what the hell is going on? These are just some of the ways what happened today in our nation's capital have been described, both online and in conversations I've had with friends and colleagues from around the country, but especially in Washington, D.C. All hell broke loose because terrorist thugs, call them what they are, these domestic hoodlums interrupted a formal proceeding where President-elect Joe Biden, as well as Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, were to be affirmed and confirmed in what this country has proudly referred to as a part of her process of peaceful transition. And yet, my sisters and brothers, these hooligans, these thugs, no, let's call them what they are, domestic terrorists, they stormed our nation's capital. And when they stormed our nation's capital, they violently took over in what must be called a traitorous act of sedition. Yeah, let's call it what it is, a traitorous act of sedition. Every single one of those persons, those terrorist thugs who stormed our nation's capital, they are engaged in sedition. They are betrayers of the, de of the democratic experience known as these disunited states of America. And today, my sisters and brothers, all hell broke loose. Why? Because under the command of their loser liar in chief they stormed our nation's capital in order to upset a peaceful proceeding needless to say there are many politicians such as Ted Cruz from this state of Texas and Hawley from the state of Iowa not to mention all of the other political enablers of one loser in chief and they my sisters and brothers they're hands are not clean. Their hands are dirty because they enabled Donald Trump, the loser in chief. They enabled him as Donald Trump, my sisters and brothers, began an all-out assault, the dismantling democracy and ripping apart our republic. But I can't even leave out the media because the media cannot act as if this is is something that they did not see coming. If they did not see it coming, every one of them should resign. After all, they helped to create the Frankenstein monster that is known as Donald Trump. All of us know that they helped to create him. After all, he built his political foundation attacking the credibility and authenticity of the presidency of Barack Obama, the first black president of the United States as he stirred up white fragility and white fear and in so doing the media continued to give him a mic even though there was no evidence that Barack Obama was not a born citizen of the United States of America but the media kept giving him a mic he began to build a cult following he knew he had a cult following after all, it was during his campaign in 2015 and 16 that he audaci audaciously acclaimed that he could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue and his cult following would still follow him. My sisters and brothers, sadly, that, 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 that began to gain momentum and eventually he received the Republican nomination and his enablers that he had lied about. He called Ted Cruz Lion Ted, not to mention uh, talking about Ted's family and Ted's father, and yet they all lined up under him because, to quote Barack Obama, they are more concerned with power than they are with being principled patriots. And we know what happened. Because of an outdated electoral college, he was elected 
as the 45th president of these disunited states of America. And we saw it coming because upon receiving the election, he continued to be himself. You saw how it eventuated in ugly xenophobia as children at the borders were separated from their parents and not to mention he kept speaking of gangs coming up through Mexico that never really materialized but it justified him building a wall that again justified his ugly xenophobia. I'm not done because we all know about his vicious racism that vicious racism that had him have the, uh, the arrogant audacity to declare my sisters and brothers that in the racist rioting going on in Charlottesville there were very fine people on both sides let's just stop right there because his own racism that we knew was rooted in his own daddy whose daddy my sisters and brothers who engaged in racism in housing and Donald Trump continued his own racism his own racist legacy as he took out a full page ad full page ad in the New York Times calling for those who eventually were exonerated they were labeled the Central Park Five but he took out a full page ad calling for the death penalty he never apologized about what he did and the media continued to let him off the hook yes you are guilty media because his unabashed racism, his ugly xenophobia, not to mention his toxic masculinity. All of this has gone on and please recognize that we have at the beginning of his presidency, him declaring there are very fine people on both sides as he sided as it were with vicious racists and then during the most recent presidential campaign, we recall in the debate when he said about the white supremacist proud boys to stand by stand down and stand by we know stand down needs means to back up but when he said stand by that was a signal not a dog whistle that was a foghorn for them to be ready at the at any moment to take a violent stand for their cult leader and then my sisters and brothers sandwiched between these evidences of racism and vicious white nationalism and supremacy we saw Donald Trump cozy up to brutal dictators as he did everything in his power to dismantle the values of our democracy attacking the freedom of the press ain't that a trip media you created the monster that turned around and attempted to destroy you I'm not even done because on top of that my sisters and brothers while cozying up to dictators and dismantling the principles of democracy he then had the arrogant audacity to build a wall and force taxpayers to pay for that wall and my sisters and brothers all the while he is called he, he is engaging in acts of racism we all recall when he attacked attack Colin Kaepernick and those who were taking a stand against injustice by taking a knee and said in a rally in Alabama, y'all know the history of Alabama, that every owner should say to those who refuse to stand during the national anthem, you're fired. And of course, the crowd went crazy. I could call the role of all that has been done as in that instance, he is standing standing against the freedom of speech and the right to peaceful assembly. Again, democratic principles. He's done everything in his power to dismantle democratic values. And so all of that has been going on. And my question is, didn't you see today coming? Didn't you see that this was going to eventually happen? Are you that blinded by American innocence living in in the 51st state of America, which is the state of denial, that you refuse to see that this was coming, that there was a 
buildup that was taking place as he tapped in to white fear, white nationalism. He tapped in to white racism while tapping in to all of that. There was a buildup that was volatile and hostile. And today, my sisters and brothers, we saw the culmination of it. Did you not see it coming? After all, he kept denying the outcome of the election where he lost by in excess of six or seven million votes. Eighty million people voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and some 74 million people, they say, voted for him, even though we all know recently we discovered that Russia again was doing a cyber attack on our systems in this country. Does that mean? I don't know. But does that mean that Russia helped him to get some votes? He's talking about votes that Biden got. No, we need to check the votes that he received that we can call into question. Didn't you see this coming? Didn't you see this hostile takeover? That's what it was by these domestic terrorists and thugs in our nation's capital. Did you not see it coming as his Republican enablers stood by and allowed it to happen? And so right now I'm calling for the resignation of Donald Trump. I'm calling for the resignation of Mike Pence. I'm calling for the resignation of Ted Cruz, Senator Howley. I'm calling for the resignation of uh, Lindsey Graham and all of those enablers who have stood by him. They need to resign right now. If they have any democratic conscience within themselves, they need to step down right now because today their hands are dirty. Today they were complicit with the violence that took place in our nation's capital. So sad is this that there were those in Congress who found themselves having to go into a secured location, hiding as it were. How shameful is this? Because is it not ironic that the same president who referred to black nations as s whole nations has created a toilet of a country called the United States where the deposit of his own waste had excrement has now filled the whole of this country. It's been done by Donald J. Trump. And I'm simply trying to say today the city, the country was in chaos. The question is, is there a word from the Lord? I'm glad to know there is because my Bible lets me know that in Acts chapter 19, Demetrius is upset. Demetrius evidently is well to do. As a matter of fact, Demetrius evidently has a lot of franchises from his silversmith business and the silversmiths had made money. You saw what the text says by creating idols. Watch this to uh, Artemis. Artemis, the great goddess of Ephesus, they created these silver idols as it were. And this was a, a, a well-to-do business. It was a lucrative business, I should say. And this lucrative business, my sisters and brothers, was now under attack by the gospel that was being preached by Paul. And the book lets us know that Demetrius stirred up the people with his lies. He stirred up the people who were deluded. The Bible even says that when they gathered in the amphitheater, theater, a lot of people didn't even know why they were there. They were just there, a part of the mob that was creating mayhem right there. And so the book lets us know it's a mob that has assembled. They're out to get Paul. They're out to kill him. They are out to get anybody who is with him. And y'all saw what the text says. It's chaos in the city. It's mayhem in the metropolis. It's a hot mess. All hell has broken loose. What can we lessons can we learn from this? I'll give you three and I'm out. Number one, the text lets us know that we see here a threat 
watch this, a threat to the economic status quo. I think it's Dr. Jennings, that brilliant scholar at Yale, who talks about the fact that whenever there is a threat to the economic status quo, at that moment, that's when people will turn on you. You see what's going on in the text. The Demetrius franchising of silver has, is now being threatened by the fact that Paul says those idols, those, those silver idols aren't really gods. They can't answer your prayers. They can't make a way out of no way. They can't open doors that no man can shut. Paul is attacking economically the status quo. And Demetrius says, you messing with our money. And y'all know what happens whenever there is a threat to the economic status quo. It's going to disrupt things. And y'all, whatever else you want to say, you need to understand a lot of people voted for Donald Trump, not because of his ethics, but because of their own greedy economics. I'll do that one more time. It was not because of ethics, because they knew he had no ethics. It was because of economics. They wanted tax cuts. They wanted to preserve their own privilege. They wanted to keep what they had. And so as a consequence, that's why they pushed him. That's why they enabled him, because they wanted to maintain an economic status quo, even if it's built on faulty pro on false premises. And so the book lets us know here they are. They have the, the st their status quo is being assaulted by the good news of the gospel because the gospel will always assault of economic status quo that, that crowns the greedy and crushes the needy. I'm going to do that thing one more time. The gospel of Jesus Christ will always assault an economic status quo that crowns the greedy and crushes the needy. After all, I serve a Savior who when he announced his first sermon, the Bible lets us know he read from Isaiah chapter 61. And you know what he said. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And William Barber lets us know the Greek word right, uh, right there in chapter 4 of Luke when Jesus is talking about good news for the poor. This is, 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 uh, it refers to people people who've been made poor, watch this, by economic exploitation. And Jesus said, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to people who've been made poor by economic exploitation. And so my sisters and brothers, I saw it coming because greed has captured the White House. Greed has captured this nation. Selfishness is the sin of this nation. You've seen it even in the response to the death-dealing disease called COVID-19 in that there are those who are too selfish to wear a mask and maintain social distancing and washing their nasty hands because they're more concerned with themselves than they are looking out for everyone else. I'm trying to let somebody know that selfishness and greed are at the core of a nation that is sick and this sick nation, my sisters and brothers, is a nation, Martin King said, that may well go to hell. Well, I got to keep it going because the text lets us know the economic status quo was under assault. But not only that, the text lets us know something else right here. And that is racism has a way of silencing voices that could bring value. I got to give that to you again because what happens in the text is you saw it. I read it. A Jew stands up to speak. I believe the name is Aristarchus. And when he stands up to speak, the Bible lets us know that once they find out he was a Jew, that's when they shut him up and shut him down. I got to go back because y'all act like y'all not believing this. A Jew stands up to speak in the midst of the mayhem, in the midst of the chaos, and tries to calm everyone down in Ephesus. But the book says that once they found out he was a Jew, once they found out that he was different, 
point, they treated him like he was demonic. Once they found out that he was not the same, they then treated him as if he was less than and not equal to. And my sisters and brothers, I think you know where I'm going right now because racism was silencing a voice that could have brought value to a volatile situation. And that's exactly what's going on. I'm going to keep it a buck. Chris, go ahead and show it right now because all of us know if black people had dared to do what was done today in the nation's capital, they would have unleashed all of the military might of this country. I'll testify, I was treated much worse than those white terrorists today when I was arrested during a peaceful protest there in our nation's capital. I was peacefully protesting. I had no weapon on me. I did not threaten the police, but they grabbed me like I did not have any humanity. They threw me along with my best friend Marvis May into a paddy wagon and my sisters and brothers for quite some time, they denied our rights. That's what they do to black bodies who engage in peaceful protesting. And yes, I'm simply trying to say at the root of what went down today is white privilege. At the root of what went down today is the sad reality that whiteness is a shield when it comes to dealing with vicious policing in this country. That's why Kyle Rittenhouse could kill two people in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who were peacefully protesting a police shooting. He could kill two people and walk down the street with his hands up knowing he's about to get arrested by the police and the police just passed him by even though they saw him with a weapon even though they saw him why because whiteness is a shield in this country it's a shield against police violence and police brutality that's why they were able to do what they did today and that is why my sisters and brothers I I can't get with these media personalities who were saying this is not America hell yeah it's a America. This a nation was born in white supremacy. It was born violently stealing the land from indigenous people and shaped by racism. Yes, this is America. Every time you say this is not America, you are living in the 51st state of this country, which is the state of denial. And the state of denial denies the reality that racism is still a sickness that may be a sickness under death in these disunited states of America. This is a sick country, a sick country that, watch this, will shut down the voices of those of us who bring so much value. I like that because this is a Jew that is speaking, and this Jew has a rich heritage. This Jew can refer to a heritage where God created life out of barrenness when Abraham and Sarah in old age gave birth to baby Isaac and Isaac and Jacob and on and on it goes until you have a, a Jewish nation. They have a rich history, a rich history where God sided with them when they were oppressed in Egypt and our ancestors sang about it and said when, uh, uh, when our children were in Egypt land, uh, God told Moses to tell old Pharaoh, let my people go showing that God is a God that shows up on the side of oppressed people. They were hushing the voice of someone whose voice could have brought value to their situation. And I'm just trying to ask America right now, why do you keep trying to shut our voices up when we bring such value to this nation? Where would this country be had it not been for soulful black people? This country has brought soul to America. You see, every time you did us dirty, somehow God gave us deliverance. Every time you attacked 
us. Somehow God blessed us. Every time you shut us up in slavery, God brought out of us the spirituals. You put our lives in jeopardy and we gave birth to jazz. Charles Adams would say, you gave us the blues and we put rhythm in front of it and now we got rhythm and blues. You gave us hell and hardship and we produce hip hop. You gave us hell and we produce Howard. You gave us mayhem and misery and we produce Morehouse College. You gave us suffering and we produce Spellman. You gave us treachery and we produce Texas College. You gave, you tried to break us and we produce Bishop College. You gave us pain and we produce Paul Quinn. Every time you gave us something bad, we brought something good out of it. And now that the nation is in need of healing, look what God keeps on doing. God says you gave us, you gave us a stolen election and we produce Stacey Abrams. And when we produce Stacey Abrams, Stacey says, I ain't got to be your governor, but I'll be the queen of Georgia and progressive politics. And the whole nation now knows they stole the election from her in 2018. But look what she did. Stacy said, I'm going to go to plotting. And she went to plotting and she organized and mobilized. And now Georgia, Georgia on my mind, Georgia sing Gladys Knight. L.A. proved too much for the man. He said he's going back to find what's left of his world and he's leaving on the midnight train to Georgia. Go ahead, Georgia, because Georgia, we now have a black preacher who presides over the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the spiritual home of Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States Senate. We also have Georgia because y'all worked y'all's us off. Uh, I think I said something right there because Ossoff is now a 33-year-old Jew, the youngest in the United States Senate. Go ahead, millennials, break into the United States Senate and let's turn this nation upside down. What y'all gonna do without black people in this country? What you gonna do without the value that we bring? We bring value because Ossoff will testify. He's a protege of John Lewis who taught him how to get into good trouble. I gotta quit. I've held you too long. I told you number one about the economic status quo that the gospel always attacks. I told you number two about the sad reality that racism will shut up voices that could bring value, especially in the midst of bad times. Ah, uh, but then there's one more thing we got to check here, and that is this text lets us know that we've got to recognize that toxic theology always produces violence, but liberating theology produces victory. I'm done. That's how I'm going to wrap that thing up. Toxic theology. Why do I say that? Because y'all saw what, uh, 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 what, what Demetrius was doing in the text. Demetrius was uniting an unholy wedlock. Please don't miss this. Treasures with his theology. Uh, money with God. I'm still not coming through. Uh, trade with theology. There it is right there. That's what Demetrius was trying to do because what's sad in this country and you look at our money, it says on it, in God we trust. They may as well put a small g there because it's not the God of heaven. The God of this country is capitalism. The God of this country is a sick capitalism that robs those who are broken and enriches those who already have the have gots exploit the have nots that is why right here in Dallas don't think I'm gonna let you off the hook because Dallas I've got to come for you as you get ready to audaciously celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. and yet you have a city where banks still engage in redlining 
community south of downtown and Dallas does nothing to stop it. You got 29 landfills on our side of town. You still allow on our side of town those things that are economically preying on our people. And then you have the nerve to think that calling in state troopers is going to quell the violence on a community that is violated every single day when we wake up. That, my sisters and brothers, is a reflection of, an, uh, of a city that has a sick theology. It's a sick theology, a toxic theology, and that toxic theology showed up today in our nation's capital. And my question now is, Paula White, what you got to say? Robert Jeffries, I ain't heard a word from you. Uh, Copeland, why aren't you saying something now? You laughed when you heard Donald Trump lost. Are you going to say anything right now? The sad reality is that you've been so busy being white, you never got around to being evangelical. Your whiteness, and you call yourselves Christians, but you're too busy white to be a Christian because if you are a show sure enough Christian, you tear down that white Jesus. That's a lie already, and you replace Place him with the right Jesus. And when you replace him with the right Jesus, you get your theology together. Because when you know the right Jesus, I'm talking about the right Jesus that was born homeless. And when, you're, when your Savior is born homeless, that means you engage in sol acts of solidarity and public policy that lift up those who are homeless. He wasn't just born homeless, but as a young kid, he was victimized by public policy. Please don't miss this that resulted in genocide. And right now, our policies are genocidal for a generation of young black boys and young black girls who find themselves going from school to the prison, school to the prison through a pipeline that is set up by public policies because of schools that do not educate our children, schools that are under-resourced and teachers are underpaid and classes are overcrowded and I'm simply trying to say it goes back to a theology that recognizes that Jesus was born homeless he was born under a genocidal watch based on public policy and then the text says he went down to Egypt and hid in Africa where Paul the White he could hang with black folk and would not be spotted out why because you only hide where you can blend in so y'all know it what no blonde bl blonde blonde blue-eyed white baby there in Egypt he'd have been found out but he had hair like wool and feet like burnt brass and that brother right there then goes to Nazareth Nazareth is the hood y'all I love that because it lets you know God always shows up and hangs out in the hood you ain't with God if you ain't spent no time hanging out in the hood trying to make the hood a better place if you have not done that but you continue to allow toxic waste dumps and environmental racism poison water to exist on our side of town you ain't with my Jesus and you've got toxic theology oh my Jesus is something else check out his ministry First Baptist Dallas check out his ministry Preston Wood Baptist check out his ministry his his ministry was to those on the margins. He gave healing to those with no health care and, and, and especially when they had pre-existing conditions. He then would stop funeral processions and transform them into festive family reunions because he was always against death dealing disease and would make sure there were testing sites on one side of town just like there were on the other side of Duke. Oops, did you get that Dallas I'm trying to let you know my sisters and brothers that we serve a savior who ministered to those on the margins he healed the sick he raised the dead he gave he gave sight to those who were blind that's what my savior did and my savior then I love it because this is my theology my theology and I spark right here parenthetically because my theology is reminiscent of a theology of the senator 
elect of the state of Georgia. I'll call him Senator Elect, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. He calls himself a Matthew 25 Christian. I like that, Raphael, because Raphael Warnock is saying, I'm a Christian who believes that public policy ought to reflect Matthew 25. Do y'all know what's in Matthew 25? I got to quit Matthew 25. Jesus said in the judgment, I'm going to judge the nations. Don't miss, don't miss that. I'm going to judge the nations by how they treat the least of these. And Jesus is going to say, I was hungry. Did you feed me? Thirsty? Did you give me water? In prison, did you visit me? A stranger, did you come see about me? Let me, Freddie Haynes, remix it. I hear Jesus in the judgment saying to America under Donald J. Trump, the loser and liar in chief, I was hungry and you cut aid to dependent children. I was thirsty and you did nothing about contaminated water especially in Flint, Michigan, and in black communities and brown communities. I was in prison because of your prison industrial complex. I was a stranger, and you built a wall and snatched children from the arms of their parents. And America is going to say, Lord, when did we do this? And that's when Jesus would say, America, go to hell, because in as much as you did it to the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you have also done it unto me. That's my theology. And so go ahead. You know what Loeffler did. She called Raphael a what? A, a radical socialist. I love that. A radical socialist. Call me a radical socialist because I believe we ought to feed the hungry. I believe everybody ought to have health care. I believe everybody ought to have access to good water. I believe the food insecure ought to be fed. Call me a radical socialist. Why? Because I serve a savior who got killed because he was a radical socialist. List. He was a radical socialist. He was such a radical socialist that my Bible says on Palm Sunday, he led a march on Jerusalem. And when he led that march on Jerusalem, the folk knew he was a radical socialist because they cried out, Hosanna. Hosanna doesn't mean hallelujah. It means save us. It doesn't mean save us pietistically or spiritually so we can go to heaven. It meant liberate us from the Roman occupation and oppression that we find ourselves under. Save us. Save us because we know you're a radical socialist. Save us because we know that radical socialism is not going to be a bad word with you. And then you know what the book says happened? He went into the temple and he saw the payday and card title loan operation. He turned that place out. And once he turned it out, you know what the book says happens next? The book says then all of the sick and lame people, they came to him and he healed them right there. That's my radical socialist named Jesus Christ. The book says that got him in trouble because it will get you in trouble. Book says he was lynched on Friday. Ah, he was lynched on Friday. But my theology says that his lynching on Friday, that ain't how the story ends. On the third day, he rose again. And when he rose again, his resurrection was an insurrection against injustice. Y'all know what happened last night in Georgia? It was a resurrection. No resurrection. Why? Because Stacey Abrams, who they thought was politically dead in 2018, but we know the resurrection took place because Georgia voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Georgia Georgia now has two senators, a 33-year-old Jew who was a protege of John Lewis and Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, who was the pastor of John Lewis. Why? Because when you know our Savior, you always have a resurrection comeback, and that resurrection is always an insurrection against the status quo. And so, America... I say to you right now, we're a country in chaos, but I serve a God who brings cosmos out of chaos. I serve a God who can 
in hate and replace it with the beloved community. And so America, I plead with you. I call on you to stand up for justice because there will be no peace until the unjust stuff cease. There will be no peace until there is justice for each and every one of us. And to close out with the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who said in that final speech, be true to what you said on paper. Be true to what you said on paper because when you're true to what you wrote in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, then we will be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.